Earlier this morning, uh, Alan Sebastian, some of you might know him as Mr. Sebastian, who has taught in our schools for a long time in this area. Uh, he was baptized in the first hour. Uh, they're testimonies to the, the story that God has us on. It's a journey. Speaking of Mr. Sebastian's story, he, he came and talked to me after the service last week, and he said, I can tell you right where I was sitting in this room when I heard Colburn Hooten preach. Now, now Colburn Hooten was pastor here decades ago, and he remembers him preaching and saying these words. If you think living a good life and being a good person will get you into heaven, it'll make you first class. But that would just be a first class ticket to hell instead of heaven. He's never forgotten that. And, and he remembered that, and he has been just kind of trying to do what God has him to do and just kind of follow his path. We had a conversation. He had placed his trust in Jesus. He had prayed and asked God to forgive him of his sins and come into his heart and life. But he had not been baptized, and he wanted to declare his faith through baptism. So decades in the making was that baptism, was that next step of faith. And that's, that's what I hope that you and I can embrace together is that we're on a journey. It's a journey. And it, if we were to sort of predict and write our own story, we would totally be way off. <laughs> you think you know, I think I know, this is what it's going to be like a month from now, a year from now, a decade from now, a week from now. And uh, we can do our best predictions, but man, we are on his journey. It's God's journey. And there's no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts to the awesome destination that God has in store for you. And we think it Man, I don't know about you. I just think it's supposed to be quicker. In fact, what I've noticed is that almost every important big trip I've ever taken has taken longer than expected. Almost every one of them. Uh, and some of those trips I'm thinking of right now, a lot of times, maybe almost every time, there's been someone on that trip with me. And there's usually one of those someones who likes to say these words, are we there Yet, I like to try to say it before my kids say it, so I could say it first. You know, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And I would, it's funny, Cameron's in the room, my son, and uh, they would ask questions when we're on trips, and I would make up very specific answers to be sarcastic. It was probably somewhat abusive for me to be as sarcastic as I was on those trips, because they say, hey, when are we going to get there? I would say 4.23 p.m. Really, Dad? Yeah. Sherry's laughing, whatever, like, no, that can't be, that's too specific, whatever. So I, they would, it got to the point where they wouldn't even ask me. But that's kind of what we experience on these trips. And they sometimes just take longer than we thought. Uh, the first time I ever flew, it was for mine and Sherry's honeymoon. We had to be at the airport at 7 a.m. for a 9 a.m. flight. And it turns out we did not fly till 10 p.m. that night. It was one of those things where they didn't say, hey, there's a 10-hour, 12-hour delay. They said, it's an hour delay. And then 30 minutes later, there's an hour delay. It just kept slightly delaying all day long. And when it got close to a mealtime, they would give us a free food voucher. And so back then, there was not food around where the gates were. So you had to get on the little tram and go to another part of the airport to go get food. We did that so many times, I was literally car sick. Before I got on the plane, I had to take Dramamine. I had bloodshot eyes on that flight. Yay, honeymoon, yeah. It, things happen that we are not expecting. Trips take longer than they're supposed to take. And sometimes the biggest, most important trips are especially that way. And that's certainly true with God's journey for you. The journey you are on, I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to take longer than you expect, and it may even be completely different than you expect. And I want us to wrap our minds around that by looking at an example of a journey in the Bible. And we're going to literally look at a whole group of people that were on a journey with God, and that is the nation of Israel. And I want to start by reading Exodus 12, 40 and 41, and it will tell you where this journey began for them. It says the people of Israel had lived in Egypt for 430 years. In fact, it was on the last day of the 430th year that all the Lord's forces left the land. On this night, the Lord kept his promise to bring his people out of the land of Egypt. So this night belongs to him. And it must be commemorated every year by all the Israelites from generation to generation. 
In these two verses, we see a starting point of a journey, but we also see a tradition being set to celebrate the starting point of that journey. This would be the Feast of Passover, which you may have heard of in, in Israelite history. They celebrated the Feast of Passover. We're not going to talk about all the Passover stuff. That's almost like three more sermons. We'll just keep it with one sermon. It's afternoon right now. Y'all are hungry, right? Uh, we'll keep it with one sermon. But that's what they were commemorating. The night that they left out of Egypt, they did a Passover meal, and they still celebrate it to this day. The reason I read this passage, though, is to show you how much time had passed before they began this journey. They were in Egypt for over four centuries. It was an ancestral existence. There was a lot of history there. They had been there a long time. They were used to being enslaved. They were used to being oppressed. They were used to not being their own people because that was their existence for over four centuries. Well, in Exodus 13, 17, and 18, it says this. When Pharaoh, which is the leader of Egypt, when Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. God said if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Thus, the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. And yet, they were not an army ready for battle. And he knew this. And that's why he took them the long way. Sometimes, the long way is God's best for you. Even though you may not like it, I prefer the shortcut. I don't want to do the scenic route, right? Are you with me on that? When it comes to life, I have this idea of the promised land, point B, and I see where I'm at at point A, and man, I'm always going to go as much as I possibly can, the shortest distance between A and B. That's a definition of a line. The shortest distance between two points. That's how I like to roll. And if there's no sidewalk there, I'll create my own path with my feet to get there. That's how I like to do things. But friends, that's not how God does things. And when he doesn't do it the way we think he ought to do it, we might become confused. We may become frustrated. It may not make sense to us. And I don't know how geographically um, aware that the Israelite people were. I am the worst. I used to think I was great with directions until I started taking up running. And they give you a list of turns if you run with a training group. Here's where you go. Turn left here, right there, right there. I, I will never do a route like that without people around me. I got so lost in Davu Park once that I thought I was going to have to eat my own hand or something, you know, to survive. It's like, what is going on? And so it's, I'm just not geographically good. I don't have a good compass inside of me. If they did, I wonder what they were thinking when they were heading out of Egypt the wrong way. Canaan's this way. We're going a different direction. Here's A, here's B. Why are we going up here? Why are we doing that? Maybe they didn't understand that. Maybe they didn't know it. But I'm here to tell you, that is the journey that God will have us on sometimes. It's a long way. Now, we can read what we just read and say, well, it makes sense. If they would have gone through Philistine territory. Now, if you know anything about the history of Israel, the Philistines, they were like the little fruit flies that get in your house. You ever had that happen? You can't find that banana, but it's somewhere. It's buried under something. And there's these little flies in your house and you try to swat them away and they just keep coming back. They're just nagging, nagging, nagging. The Philistines were the fruit flies for the Israelites. All through their history, it, you, oh wait, this group of people is coming to challenge Israel. It's the Philistines again. It's the Philistines again. And the most famous of all the Philistines was Goliath, a giant that David ended up slaying. Now, they had just left slavery and in order to get to the promised land, they were going to have to go through the land of the Philistines. God knows best. God knew what they could handle and what they could not handle, so he sends them a different way, the long way. You've got to believe that God's the same way with you and me, right? When you're on the long way and it don't make any sense and it's taking a while and it's frustrating, you can bet God loves you enough that he's got you on the long way. He loves you. He knows what's best for you. So you have to hang on to trust. This is why they call it faith. 
We, we, we throw that word around like faith. Yeah, you've got to have faith. Everybody's got to have faith. But we don't want to have that kind of faith. We're like, hey, this doesn't make sense. There's a quicker way there if we could just do this. The worst situations we find ourselves in as human beings is when God has us going one way and we think we have a quicker way. We think we have a better way. So we try that way. <laughs> and then we're in real trouble when we do that. God's long way for you is his best way for you. Now, it says in Exodus 13, 21 and 22, something pretty cool that God gave them. The Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night and the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. I'll take one of those. Anybody else want one of those? I mean, give me, I'll take, don't even have to be a pillar. It can be a little miniature cloud with a little miniature flame, and I will go wherever it goes. I just wish sometimes it was that easy to go where God wants us to go. Guess what? Here's what I've learned from reading the New Testament part of the Bible. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, that pillar of fire, it's in you. The Holy Spirit. He places his spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave, that made that tomb empty in the first place, it takes up residence in you. It's just a little bit harder because we have to become in tune with him. We have to be in relationship with him. We can't just look with our eyes and see an object and follow it. No, instead we actually have a person that wishes to speak to us and nudge us and guide us, which is actually way better but we're guilty of not really listening to that voice. And we allow so many other voices, our own voice, the voice of our own desires, the voice of our own comfort, the voice of our own convenience. And that's just our voices, let alone the voices of the world and our peers and our friends. We have to somehow discern the, the, the voice of God that is within us in the midst of all that. We have the pillar of fire to guide us. It's the person of God himself made possible through Jesus Christ. So we have that, don't have to be geographically unchallenged <laughs> in order to follow God. Now, you might have noticed that it said earlier that when God took Israel out of Egypt, they went the long way, and that way was towards the Red Sea. If you don't know the story, I will tell you in brief form that the Israelites eventually got right up to the Red Sea, but what had happened in the meantime was the Egyptians begin to have a lot of remorse for what they have done. They had regretted letting Israel go. They lost a lot of slave labor when the Israelites left. Who's going to build our buildings? Who's going to do all the work that we weren't doing? They were doing all this. We got to go back and get them. Never mind all the plagues that they endured. It didn't matter. They had to have those people back. So they had reorganized their army and had sent it out to go recapture Israel. So they followed God's lead, pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, day by day, all the way to the Red Sea. And when they got to the Red Sea, they had the Red Sea in front of them and they had the Egyptian army pressing in behind them. And when that happened, God gave Moses these words to say to the people. Exodus 14, 14. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Some of you all need to write that down right now. Because you probably may be going through something where you can see the Red Sea in front of you and the army of Egypt behind you. It's something different than that, of course. And you're wondering, how am I getting out of this? What do I do next? How do I even go forward? I'm stuck. I'm in trouble. What do I do? This is where faith comes in. Do you actually believe that the Lord will fight for you? Do you actually believe he's got you? Do you actually believe that where you are right now is not by accident and he's gonna somehow use this part of your journey for a grand purpose? It's hard to believe that when you have the army right there behind you and the Red Sea right in front of you. And I didn't read some of the verses around Exodus 14, 14 where everybody was freaking out about what was going on. But if you haven't heard the story, a miracle happened. 
God commanded Moses to raise his wooden staff in front of the Red Sea. And when he did that, he began to part the Red Sea. And the Israelites were able to go across the Red Sea on dry land. And when the Egyptian army began to pursue them on the same path, those waters came down upon them and a great victory happened. A miracle. So let me read to you Exodus 14, 31. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Awesome. And it would be so good if the book of Exodus ended with that verse. Happy ending, right? They crossed over on dry ground through the Red Sea. The Israelite people were like, yay, God, that's so awesome. Look at what he did. He is amazing. He gave us a great victory. He took care of us. This is so awesome. And, and it is. And what's great about it, I love it, it says they put their faith in the Lord. And that's what this is all about. The journey he has you on will always result in a deeper dependence on him. Never forget that. Because once you forget that, you begin to think it's about something else. You begin to think it's maybe about you. Maybe it's about something I'm going to accomplish. Maybe it's just something I'm supposed to do for God. And you know, the older I get, that's what I start hearing myself say. I really want my life to make a difference. I really want my life to matter. And I think that's something that everybody goes through as you continue to go through life, the older you get, especially like, okay, have I fulfilled what I'm supposed to be here for? Am I making a difference? Does my life matter? And yes, I want that so badly. But if we're not careful, the, the, the facet of that that we kind of turn towards is, is kind of in the mirror. Like me, what am I doing? And how am I making a difference? But the journey God has us on is to be reminded that you don't part the Red Sea. I do. You don't guide yourself on the right path. I do. You don't get to the promised land. I lead you to the promised land. And why is that so important to God? Because we've said this so many times in this room. That's his end game is a relationship with you. That's what it's all about. That's the trophy at the finish line is you being in relationship with God. Heaven is all about being with God forever and being with all those who also believed in him. It's relational. It's worshipful. And for some of us, we are trying to live a Christian life where it's really kind of about my performance and what I'm doing and how much I'm enjoying it while I do it. And we're not really leaning into relationship with the one who made us. We're going to be so not ready for heaven when it's all about that. We're going to cast our crowns down at the feet of Jesus because it's about him. Deeper dependence on him results in a, an actual faith trust in our father, our good, good father. Like you really do know what's best for us. You really did provide for me. You really did rescue me. You really did lead me. I can take zero credit for what's going on because it was all you, God. That's what God is striving for. He wants to glorify himself in and through your life. And in order to do that, you can't depend on you. You must depend on him. It's about relationship. That's what he wants to do in our lives. <laughs> so, the people saw the mighty power of God and they were like, man, this is awesome. We believe in you, God. And even we even believe in Moses. You, you, he is a good, pretty good dude after all. So that's Exodus 14, 31. One month later, Exodus 16, 3, I'm going to quote the Israelite people to you. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. <laughs> well, there's a mood change right there, right? That thing got dark quick. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you have brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. And we don't judge because guess what you and I do too? Wah, wah. Wow, we do it too, right? This is the journey that we're all on. One day, yay, God. Next day, why, God? That's what we do, right? This is how we live our lives. And I would want to say, let's try to limit the wah, wah, wah days and try to be more like yay, God. But listen, 
every single one of us in this very room, you're going to have days like both of those days in your journey with God. That's just the nature of the journey. I'm not even sure it's a bad thing that we wah, wah sometimes because as a result of that happening, here's what happened next. Exodus 16, 35. So the people of Israel ate manna from heaven. He provided. He said, I hear you. You're starving to death. I hear your cries. I hear your whines. And I shall provide. And he did. So the people of Israel ate manna for 40 years until they arrived at the land where they would settle. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And when I read that verse, I hear, yay, in my mind, you know, glass half full, yay, we ate manna. God provided, he gave us manna for 40 years, and then we were at the promised land. Praise God, right? If we were to go back into a time machine, if we're going to a time machine and go back to that time, some of those Israelites you might have interviewed might have been like, we ate manna for 40 stinking years. I mean, you might like, you might like mac and cheese. Have you ever had it three meals a day for four decades? Right? That's a different, that's a different kind of story right there, right? And there are verses after that verse where that's exactly kind of what they were saying. And, and man, it was good too. The way it described it, it was like honey and it was like a wafer and all that. I almost imagine kettle corn, kettle popcorn. Like it was like, it tasted, it was good. He provided something good for them, but 40 years. And then, oh, I forgot the other more important part. He gave us manna for 40 years. We were in the wilderness for four decades. I don't know if you've picked up on this or not. It took God one night to get Israel out of Egypt, but it took him 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. They were still in Israel. Remember back in the day when we were slaves? At least we had pots of meat and all the bread we could want. Man, they were still ready to snap back into their old ways. They were still ready to snap back into their old ways. They were ready to go back to Egypt. A month after seeing the Red Sea part. Friends, God's doing that journey in you too and in me too. Our Egypt is something different. But unless God puts us in the wilderness for a while, unless he puts us on a scenic route, he, we, we don't become what God wants us to be. He was making a nation who believed in him. They were his people. But in the wilderness, they were on some days his people. And on many days they weren't. They were ready to go back to Egypt at any moment. And he had to put them on that scenic route so that they could become his people. And I don't want you to ever forget that this is the whole point of all of it. Before God does something through you, he spends a long time doing something in you. It's the pattern. You see it all over the Bible. Last week we talked about Abraham. He was fi when he finally had his first child with Sarah, who was going to be the, the, the beginning of this promise that Abraham would be the father of many nations. He was 100 years old when they finally had that child. Talk about a long journey. That took a little while. Talk about a flight delay. That was a long flight delay right there. At Moses himself, when God spoke to him from a burning bush to say, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go, he was 80 years old. Hey, as long as you're living and breathing God's good air, you're still on this journey. There's a step for you to take. There's an act of obedience for you to take. There's an opportunity for you to grow in dependence upon him as long as you're still alive. That's the journey that, that we're on. Even the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, I love his story because he had this miraculous conversion. He was a terrorist of Christians one day, and then the next day, he was a believer in Jesus Christ and began preaching right away. But you know what? They had to send him to Tarsus, a city where he stayed for three years before he became a missionary. It wasn't immediate. It took time. And that's what we, we have got to be more patient. We've got to be more faithful. And faithful doesn't mean, yeah, look what I do. It means, no, I'm trusting what he's doing. Although this journey seems long. Although this journey seems hard. He's doing something in you. He cares more about who you become than what you try to do for him. That's why he took so many years, even decades, to work inside of Abraham and Moses and Saul before they actually did something that we talk about. He had to get them ready for that. 
And friends, I'm here to tell you, all of us in this room, that's the journey we are on. It's a journey in you. And yeah, he's going to do something through you too. We'll talk about that as we close the series next week. But for today, take a look at your journey right now. What is he doing in your life? For Israel, he had to take Egypt out of them. And I believe he has to do that for us. There is something he's trying to get out of you. There's something he wants to remove out of you. And not only did that happen, but God was putting things in Israel too. The journey that they were on while they were in that 40 years, it was not a, um, a boring 40 years per se. You can see the whole journey they were on for the rest of the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Man, they got the law that God gave to Moses to give to them. They disobeyed it right away, tried to worship a golden calf. He had to give it to them again. I mean, there was all kinds of stuff that happened while they were in the wilderness. And everything that happened, God used it to help them to become his people. And that's the journey you're on. So what do we do with this? Okay, that's cool to know. God's working in me. He wants to do something in me. And that's the most important part of his journey is what he does in me rather than what he does through me. Okay, I get all that. What do I do about this? If I can give you one next step to take today, it's simply this. Stay on course with God because you will be tempted to go back to Egypt. Don't do it. Don't do it. Stay on course. Hang on. Have faith. Depend on him. He will fight for you. Stay calm. And for somebody in this room, you may have not even gotten on course with God yet. You're not even on that journey yet. If that's you, just like we talked about with Ashley being baptized earlier in the service, she had placed her faith in Jesus Christ. That was the beginning of her journey. And we don't have that pillar of fire in us, that Holy Spirit within us to guide us unless we place our faith in us so we begin the journey. And so if you've never begun it, begin it today. How do you do that? The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whosoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. You just turn to Jesus. Say, okay, I'm handing you the GPS. I'm handing you the map. You are my map. I will no longer do life my way anymore. Lord, it's you. I'm ready to be on course with you. If you've never done that in your life, today's the day. Pray to him today and say, okay, Jesus, I'm with you now. And man, buckle up. Pack a bag. Get your snacks ready. It's going to be a journey. Get your Dramamine ready. That's what I need. Some of us need some spiritual Dramamine because his hairpin turns at times. But trust in him. Now, some of you may have been on that journey for some time. I think an important step in that journey is what we've seen Alan and Ashley do today by being baptized. Y'all probably sick of like, man, why do you talk about baptism all the time? The reason we talk about it all the time is because Jesus did it. And it's one of the most important spiritual steps you can ever take because it galvanizes your commitment to God. It galvanizes it. It's slipping on that wedding ring. It's saying, man, I want the world to know, and I want especially God to know that I am yours. And God uses that. It's you providing a Red Sea moment for the whole world to see. Because see, not only did the Israelites get a yay moment with God, look, you part of the Red Sea. Once they got to Canaan, guess what they had heard about? This group of people in the wilderness that God apparently parted the Red Sea for. He even gave them some kind of dessert-like wafer that just fell on the ground every day for them to eat. They were scared of Israel before they met Israel because God was with them. And when there's a baptism, if I'm sitting there and I don't, I don't really know that I'm even on course with Jesus and I see someone say, yeah, after decades of me placing my faith in him, I realize I need to declare my faith to him and be baptized. And they get put under the water and brought back up out of it to symbolize the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I'm like, man, God's moving in their life. I want that too. And that's the whole point that God glorifies himself. Maybe at some point when you're asking hard questions to God, and I like to do that sometimes, 
Not as much as I used to, but I, I sometimes wonder, what's up with this God glorifying himself? Is he kind of like a prideful God? I just want to be famous. Is he like, just want to be famous? Is What's going on? That's not what it is at all. He's glorifying himself because he is life. And unless people see him in us, they'll never know the source of life, the source of hope, the source of love, the source of joy. If they say, wow, Bill's awesome. Oh, Hickory Grove, they're awesome. And they don't see God, we have failed. They need to see God, not us. They need to see God, not you. And the only way they will ever see that happen is that they find you at some point in your life saying, I do not know what to do. I am scared and I'm stuck. Almost like the Red Sea's in front of me and the army's behind me. And they see you hold on to faith and cry out to God. And they see him do a work in you. And then they'll know there's a God in heaven. And maybe he'll do something in me too. That's the journey God has you on. So if you feel like you're stuck, if you feel like it's a long journey, if there's parts of that journey you wish you could erase, hey, guess what? You're just like Israel. That's okay. Stay on course with God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for teaching us this today. And Lord, there might be someone here that has never begun their journey with you. And I pray right now, God, that you would hear their prayers. They cry out to you and say, okay, Jesus, I want to start this journey. I want to start my journey right now. May they cry out to you and just simply say, oh, God, forgive me of my sins. I know you sent your son Jesus to die for me. And now I want to live for you. I want to... I want to follow you. And Lord, help that person that's praying that prayer know that starting today, they are a born again child of yours. And you are their father forever and ever and ever. And Lord, maybe someone here has yet to do what Ashley and Alan did today and proclaim their faith through baptism. They've been waiting and waiting, maybe even scared to do it. And now's the time. They know that that pillar of fire inside of them is saying, it's time to do this. Give them the courage to make that choice. And Father, Lord, maybe those are not issues for some of the people in this room, but Lord, they're facing a Red Sea. and They're scared. We've all been there. And if we haven't, we will be. Lord, thank you for reminding us that once we've placed our faith in you, we are your children. You know what's best and you will fight for us. And you will be glorified through everything we endure. Help us to be patient on this long journey we're on with you. Deepen our relationship with you along the way, oh Father. Help us with every single step we take. Guide us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.